The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is brought to you by Clinica Sierra Vista. Welcome back to the 17 News at Sunrise podcast, where we share your news on your schedule. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. Good morning here at 5 a.m. I'm Maddie Jansen alongside Alex Fisher. And that rain from yesterday is uh, yesterday's storm continues to fall across the county this morning, like Kevin said. Now, this is video of the rain falling in Tammy Melchok's backyard in northwest Bakersfield around 630 last night. There were no major crashes in our area yesterday or this morning, although there were quite a few minor incidents reported, especially during the heaviest parts of the storm. Yeah, it's definitely a little slippery out there. And check this out. China Peak Ski Resort says this latest storm dumped 8 to 10 inches of fresh snow yesterday. What a beautiful sight that is. The resort is closed today, but will reopen Thursday. And more good news, the resort says they'll stay open for as long as conditions allow. A lot of good news right there, but the latest round of wet weather across the state, far from enough to get California out of this drought. After having the three driest months in recorded history, and most of the state in at least severe drought. Governor Gavin Newsom yesterday signed an executive order to boost water conservation. He is requesting state water regulators to consider a ban on watering decorative grass at businesses and institutions. His administration estimates the action could save hundreds of thousands of acre feet worth of water. Um, we're not asking for our communities to you know dry up their their parks or recreational spaces or allow their trees um, to to die uh, to the contrary but we are suggesting that um, non-functional turf in other words turf the only time you ever ever gets walked on is to mow another part of the governor's executive order urges regulators to require urban water suppliers to move up a level in their water saving efforts to stage two now, those levels and plans were established and tailored for each local water agency as a result of the state's last dr uh, drought to prepare for water shortages. For example, level two for many communities includes reducing the number of days residents can water outdoors. Every county in California remains under a drought-related emergency declaration. State officials say they're trying to conserve water early before the drought intensifies. Making headlines around the state, tens of thousands of Southern California grocery workers have overwhelmingly voted to authorize their union to call a strike. The United Food and Commercial Workers Union announced over the weekend 95% of their members approved the potential walkout. A three-year contract covering 47,000 workers at 540 stores expired March 6th. Employees are demanding higher wages for full-time workers and higher minimum wage for part-time workers. Hours are being cut. You're asked to do more with less time, with less people to do the job, and it's not the same. We have workers that, you know, they can't afford to live. They have to share their apartments with other people just to make the rent payment. A strike could begin at Albertsons, Vons, Pavilions, and Ralph's in several days. Negotiations between the union and supermarkets are set to resume tomorrow. Meantime, the Supreme Court has agreed to review a challenge to a California law that set certain conditions for pork sales. The case stems from a 2018 ballot measure where California voters approved the nation's toughest living space standards for breeding pigs. The National Pork Producers Council and the American Farm Bureau Federation are challenging the law, saying almost no farm satisfied those conditions. The law had a January 1st effective date but California is currently allowing the, condition, uh, the continued sale of pork process under the old rules. A bill to suspend California's gas tax is on hold after being heard yesterday in the Assembly Transportation Committee. During the hearing, Democratic Assembly member Alex Lee proposed an amendment that would instead add a tax for oil producers. A suspension of the gas tax is one of four current plans aiming to provide relief to Californians. Democrats have proposed three other plans, all of which surround a rebate to drivers. The state assembly unanimously approved a bill designed to extend the moratorium on rental evictions for those behind on their bills due to the coronavirus pandemic. That is according to nonprofit news organization CalMatters. The bill now heads to the state Senate for a vote. The state's eviction moratorium is currently set to expire on Thursday. The current law says a judge must pause an eviction proceeding if a rent relief application is pending. Assembly Bill 2179 
proposed last week by Concord Democrat Tim Grayson, would shield tenants through June 30th as the state continues to process their paperwork. Governor Gavin Newsom will likely sign this bill. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden was in the Central Valley yesterday, ahead of Cesar Chavez Day on Thursday. She attended a naturalization ceremony at the National Chavez Center in Keene. The First Lady touched down at Meadowsfield Airport in Bakersfield just before 9 a.m. and wasted no time heading up the mountain into the heart of California, a Californian immigrant's story. The wind and rain welcomed the First Lady to Curran County. Staying dry inside Villa La Paz, Dr. Biden helped welcome dozens of newly naturalized American citizens. America is and has always been defined by us. Now you, we the people. The First Lady's second visit to Kern County in as many years once again spotlighted Cesar Chavez, the labor organizer and civil rights leader who did much of his work in the Central Valley. Dr. Biden praised Chavez and other notable immigrants for their contributions to American society. She also encouraged the 31 newly naturalized VIPs to make the most of their citizenship. For some in the crowd, it was surreal. Yeah, I kind of wanted to scream, but I can't. <laughs> but um, it's, it's really a very uh, emotional and important moment for us. The First Lady also recognized the current president of the United Farm Workers, Teresa Romero. Romero is the first female president of the UFW, a group Cesar Chavez helped to found. It's on a bus of Cesar Chavez that used to be in the visitor center of the Cesar Chavez National Monument is currently residing in the White House. The bronze bus was loaned to the White House by the Chavez Foundation and was put on display in the Oval Office shortly after President Biden took office last year. Chavez's son and president of the foundation, Paul Chavez, says having the bus there is a symbol of hope for the nation. We turn now to your 17 homicide tracker and police are investigating a deadly shooting that took place early yesterday morning on East Truxton at a nightclub in East Bakersfield. The shooting broke out around 2 a.m. leaving one dead and one critically hurt while a third person was shot in his own bedroom by a stray bullet. One neighbor across the street from the nightclub says his family woke up to gunfire. Two o'clock in the morning I see, I see the shot. And I get up, I see the, my son, you know, still in the bed. And I, I see the, the, the police and the fire, firemen. Bakersfield police have not released the identities for any of the victims, and there's no suspect's information at this time. Now we know the name of a man who was shot and killed in South Bakersfield early Sunday morning. It happened just after 1 a.m. on Lotus Lane near Bradshaw Street. The coroner's office reports that 52-year-old Reginald Anthony Johnson was killed in that shooting. Police say 32-year-old Jermale Keaton was arrested. Keaton was booked on a first-degree murder charge along with other charges. If you know anything about the shooting, you're encouraged to call BPD at 327-7111. By our count, there have been 21 homicides in Kern County so far this year. You can head to our website, kget.com, click the homicide tracker icon to see stories about these victims and resources for those impacted by the killings. Meantime, the Kern County Sheriff's Office is looking for a man wanted for shooting another man in Oildale this weekend. It happened Sunday around 2.15 p.m. in the area of McCord Street and Plymouth Avenue. The Sheriff's Office says the victim, who is expected to survive, was involved in some sort of a disturbance. Witnesses say the shooter took off in a black pickup truck. If you know anything, call Kern County Sheriff's Office at 861-3110. Now to a major house fire in southwest Bakersfield. Owner Bill DeStefani tells our Robert Price his dog alerted him to the danger. And within hours, a suspect was under arrest. His three-story, 18,000-square-foot mansion, a few hundred feet away from the unattached office where he was sleeping, was on fire. He called the fire department for help. The mansion on Buena Vista Road, just south of McCutcheon Road, was well involved, according to Kern County Fire, but fortunately unoccupied. In fact, Palazzo de Stefani, as the sprawling mansion is called, has not had full-time occupants since it was built in 2007. It's often been used as a wedding venue. But according to DeStefani, one man was on the property, uninvited. I caught up with DeStefani Monday morning as he walked through what remained of the mansion with fire investigators. They caught the guy, set this on fire, then went to the cabana and was starting one there. The fire truck had already gotten here. The fireman saw him, tried to catch him. The guy ran out. They got a good description, ran into the trees. And got away. For a few hours, anyway. 
Fire investigators spotted a man who matched the previous night's description and detained him at 9.20 Sunday morning at Independence High School. The fire department says he had allegedly started two additional fires. The suspect, Marty Cias, was booked on three felony arson charges. His bail was set at $85,000 and he faces an arraignment hearing Tuesday. Firefighters battled the blaze all night, working until Monday morning to make sure it was completely extinguished. The home has eight bedrooms, nine and a half bathrooms, and sits on 19 acres. Its assessed value is $3 million, although Zillow has it listed at $4 million. And according to DeStephanie, a well-known 77-year-old local farmer and recreational pilot, it was not insured. Robert Price, 17 News. Now, DeStephanie says he does not know the suspect, Marty C.S., but C.S. has a relatively long criminal record. A felony charge for disorderly conduct with intent to terrorize, which was reduced to a misdemeanor, and a half dozen other misdemeanor arrests. In your 17 Court Watch now, jury selection for the murder trial of Matthew Queen has wrapped up, according to court officials. 45-year-old Queen and his ex-girlfriend, Bailey Despot, are accused of torturing and killing Michael Holsenbake in 2018. Holsenbeck's severed arm was found in the Kern River and his skull recovered last year east of the overflow parking lot of Piles Boys Camp. Queen is charged with murder, torture and dozens of other offenses in what's become known as the Bakersfield 3 case. Despot has been missing since 2018. Queen's trial is set to begin next Monday and is expected to last about 45 days. Now to an update on the coronavirus in Kern County and numbers are down locally as we move from what health officials say a pandemic to an endemic. Public Health now releases data three days a week on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So this is our first update since Friday, which will show higher numbers over that three day span. Now Monday's numbers showed 65 new positive cases and eight new deaths attributed to the virus. State data shows 25 people are in the hospital with COVID-19 in our area. Seven more are in the ICU. And Pfizer's COVID-19 uh, COVID pill Paxlovid is being studied by British scientists to be approved as a possible treatment for hospitalized patients. The tests are being called the recovery trial. Paxlovid has already been approved for early stage COVID treatment across Britain, but this study aims to see if the, lower, or if the drug can lower the risk of death among COVID patients in hospitals. More than 2,000 unvaccinated United Airline employees are returning to work this week. The workers were all approved for a religious or medical accommodation. They will return to their former positions after being out on unpaid leave. Last October, the company fired more than 230 employees who refused to get vaccinated. Those who were fired did not seek an exemption. United says it is confident it can safely bring back unvaccinated workers because of the decline in COVID cases, hospitalizations and deaths nationwide. Today is National Vietnam Veterans Day and Portrait of a Warrior Gallery will hold a special breakfast and remembrance ceremony this morning in honor of those who came home from the war in Vietnam and those who did not. 17's Chris Burton is live at the gallery this morning with more. Good morning, Chris. Alex, good morning. Local veterans advocates say that Vietnam veterans in particular didn't receive the welcome home that they deserved when they came home from the war. Days like this are... Uh, attempting to change that. I'm joined now by Armando Solis. He is a docent here at Portrait of a Warrior Gallery. He's also a Vietnam veteran himself. And Armando, could you just first tell us where we're standing right now? We are standing in the memorial room uh, honoring our 177 Kern County residents that gave their life during the Vietnam War. So there are 177 portraits here, pictures of a, a member of the Kern County Armed Services that that gave their life. But for you in particular, there's one big reason to celebrate and remember today. Yes. Uh, this is my brother, Tommy Solis. He was killed in Vietnam in September of 1967. Can you tell me a little bit about him? He was the recipient of the Navy Cross. Uh, him and his uh, platoon were out on patrol when they came under an ambush. And uh, one of the machine gunners was killed. He ran about 50 yards on top of an uh, uh, infantry mobile unit, mounted the 30 caliber and gave suppressing fire while the rest of the platoon took cover and took care of their wounded. He was finally shot and killed up there. I'm so sorry to hear that, but it is days like today that help us remember his memory and the memory of all 177 people in this room. Can you tell us a little bit about the event today and some of the things you guys are doing? Yes, uh, this is the fifth annual 
National Vietnam War Veterans Day. This is the second time we've had it here at the gallery, the Portrait of a Warrior Gallery here at 1925 I Street. So we're not only going to celebrate uh, all of the veterans that gave all, but we're also going to celebrate some of the veterans that gave some of their life. So we're going to just welcome them home and thank them for their service. Absolutely, Armando. Thank you for your service. And uh, this event kicks off at 9 a.m. this morning, again, at the Portrait of a Warrior Gallery here on the corner of 20th and I Streets. Armando, uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. All right, Alex. All right, Chris, thanks so much. You know, you think about our Vietnam veterans especially. You know, they came home and they were not welcomed back. And I know that uh, every time, we, we, we both talk to Vietnam veterans, and that's one of the things that they always say is how difficult it was to, to return home because they did not get the welcome back that yeah. they were kind of wanting so, and, and, and that they deserved. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they definitely appreciate the things done yeah. now, and this is a great uh, continuation of those efforts. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is a production of KGET and Nexstar Media Group. For more on all of the headlines in today's show, head to KGET.com.